proper, the respondents are told the nature of the claims against them. Two of the three respondents, President Mahama and the Electoral Commission, EC, filed separate applications, praying the Supreme Court to order the petitioners to furnish them with further and better particulars of the petition. They said they wanted further and better particulars with respect to the names and quotes of the 4,709 polling stations, constituencies and regions where alleged electoral irregularities took place. The petitioners had opposed the request of the applicants, arguing that the court ought not to allow the EC to employ an application for further and better particulars to compel them to disclose the nature of evidence they intend to lead during the trial. The argument, however, failed. The request by the, the respondent, particularly in this case the first respondent, for further and better particulars of the claims and allegations that the petitioners have been making all along for the last one month, this court today granted us leave to have them respond to the several allegations that they're making. They have to provide particulars. The 4,709, which they've made so much noise about, they are to supply to us but polling stations, and quote number, at the alleged gross and widespread irregularities, particulars, the constituency in tabular form. They have to provide even the regions, the constituencies, the quotes, the names, all those details. Particularly also where they claim that certain votes were annulled. Um, they have to, uh, oh, sorry, they said that certain votes have to be annulled and then transferred and deducted from the president's vote, they will have to explain how they came by that conclusion. So many allegations have been made, and this forms the basis of their petition. Now, our case is that these do not exist, and the case is in court. The court has now granted our prayer that they should provide us with further and better particulars. That is the detail of their allegations. This is the test time. In the case of the application for interrogatories to be served on the third, the second respondent, the court granted the application of the petitioners in all respects. So at the end of the day, we were not fishing, neither pearl trolling. <laughs> there was also pending an application for leave to amend our petition. An objection was taken on the part of the third respondent by Mr. Chachuchikata. That preliminary legal objection was overruled. And the substantive application for leave to amend our petition has been adjourned to the seventh. There is also an application for interrogatories by the first respondent. That has also been adjourned to 7th, that is Thursday, for the court, so that when we get the certified true copy of the court's ruling on the further and better particulars and our inter interrogatories, then the applicants will better consider whether to go on, because some of the relief they are asking have already been granted. The court also, by a unanimous decision, granted the petitioner's application to direct the EC to provide them with detailed records of persons abroad who voted in the elections. They had requested details of the names and addresses of persons who were registered overseas and the mode and manner in which those persons were registered. Um, we are joined users to learn President John Mahama will move to the Flagstaff House by the end of this week. A statement signed by Information Minister Mahama Ayarga says the seat of government will officially move from the castle also to the Flagstaff House on Thursday, 7 February 2013. This means President John Dramani Mahama will from Thursday conduct formal government businesses from the Flagstaff House. Journalists making the presidential press call have been informed by the castle staff they will be giving new accreditation even as their current access cards expire, but also to accommodate the new arrangements that may be in place at the new facility. President John Mahama recently hinted intentions to relocate when some children called on him at the castle. 
Castle staff have also been officially informed about the pending movement and some auxiliary officers have already relocated. According to the statement, there will be a short ceremony to commemorate the movement at 10 a.m. at the Flagstaff House on February 7. The Vice President late last year moved into his office at the Flagstaff House. It is, however, unclear if the President would also move into the official presidential residence located within the confines of the Flagstaff House immediately to enable his current official residence to be prepared for the Vice President. The President will, will still occupy the official residence of the Vice President at Cantonment. The President's relocation should bring to an end the controversy over occupancy of the building which began after the NDT won the 2008 election and then President John Mills declined to use the multi-million dollar edifice citing security lapses and certain defects. Now, ahead of officially assuming work as Ministers of State, the Ministers of Education, Professor Nana Upukwajimang, Environment, Science and Technology and Innovation, Dr. Joe Otengeje, as well as local government and rural development, Kwesi Opong Ofusu, have been outlining their priority areas in their respective ministries. The uh, manifesto states that we have to work with Attorney General to create um, a legal a court system that we can send entities that break the environmental rules. On the, on the area of science, technology and innovation, what His Excellency is looking at is that for us to mature into the kind of economy that will take us into the upper level of the uh, middle income economy, there's a need for us to have innovation driven. And that brings a lot of challenges. How do we motivate our scientists to move away into a core area that would drive our natural resources? How do we sustain science and in the basic level of education? Innovation is basically taking the technology, modifying it a little bit to fit into your strength. And so we're looking at innovation in agri. What are the challenges that we are facing in terms of environment? Those crops and plants that we have developed the technology, can we move it into a next level where the private sector can come in, take those kind of technologies, own it and invest in it so that it can be seen in the economy. I'm very interested in basic education because that is where it begins. That will be my top priority and the public schools because, because the public schools train more people than the private schools. This is not to say that I don't care about the, primary, the public schools. I care about all education regardless. But we also know that certain areas need a bit more help. So we need to begin with those. You've been in academia over the while. So how do you think you would do in this new role? The vision is to raise the level of our life to a higher notch. I'm not sure if that is, is divisible. Madam, what's your take on the um, um, duration for uh, SHS? Three years or four years? This argument has been finished. So what's the point? How? Finished how? It's been decided. We are on a three-year program. It's finished. It's we all need to update our knowledge on what is this so we can serve our public better. We've been running the three years since 1987. We need to get the assemblies to be entrepreneurial. If the issue of local economy is taken seriously, we are going to generate income and create jobs. It's a key issue and if we want to move into the, the middle income status, we need to tackle sanitation headlong and everybody in this country must be part of that process. Staying at the presidency, congratulatory messages from the various houses of chiefs continue to trickle in for President John Dramani Mahama as discussions on developing their respective regions dominate discussions. President Mahama has been using the opportunity to restate his commitment to deliver on all campaign promises, assuring they will be prominently included in bringing governance to the doorstep of the people. Today was the 10 of the Central and Western Region House of Chiefs, led by the Abiyazahene, Nana Kwebwewusi, the Central Region House of Chiefs urged the President to tap from their knowledge in the administration of the country and build bridges that foster unity in the country after a keenly contested partisan election. We would want to express our sincere gratitude to you for the honor done the chiefs and people of Central Region by selecting His Excellency Pa Kwesi and Mr. Atta as your vice. 
as well as Mr. E.K.T. Ado for the Central Regional Minister designate. Nana Anumu have also taken note of Dr. Dana's appointment as Minister designate for Chieftaincy and Tradition. And Nana Anumu, thank you for that as well. They said the region faces developmental challenges to which they were drawing the president's attention and congratulated him on his assumption of duty. In response, President Mahama said it was unacceptable that the central region is categorized as the fourth poorest region in Ghana. He cited ongoing work at the Kotokraba market as evidence of government's intention to complete all projects commenced by late President Mills. The Cape Coast Stadium is a grant from the Chinese government free of charge and uh, that has also been approved. The designs are all ready and soon work will start. It is also our intention to upgrade the Cape Coast Central Regional Hospital into a teaching hospital. I want to assure you that we're going to continue it and find the resources for SEDACOM to become a development vehicle in the central region as SADA has become in the northern uh, region. The central region, he said, will record a significant change in the next four years. The Western Region House of Chiefs was led by Osajefo Kwamina Enemil, spokesperson for the House Odenehue Japon Abebio II, after conveying their customary congratulations, said indigents of the Western Region are of the notion that all the country is interested in is their wealth of natural resources and called for more development. It is our hope that the indigents of the Western Region will know and feel the presence of our sons and daughters in the effort to rule the region and Ghana gently on the road to recovery, growth, and shared prosperity. There are times we have felt that it is only our naturally endowed resources that Ghana wants. Although there are times we have felt that our region's relationship with Accra neglects the whole philosophy of justice. We offer you all the necessary cooperation and collaboration. They were, however, hopeful of a rapid takeoff in the next few years. To them also, President Mahama said one of the major interventions to be made in the Western region was to improve the road network and work towards making the region the hub of Ghana's oil and gas industry. We're going to work on some of them under the CDB facility, that is the oil and clay road. I'm sending a team to China to speed up the disbursement of the CDB facility. The bulk of the CDB facility is going to be invested in the Western region, in excess of $1 billion for the gas processing plant, you know, and once the gas processing plant is put in place, we will be able to supply gas to the thermal plants that we have already put at the Abwansi area. There's also a new free zones enclave for putting up the downstream petrochemical industry in the Western region. To both houses, he promised to call on them to especially thank them for their roles in the elections and hospitality shown him. Spokesperson for former President John Ejikum Kufo, Frank Ejikum, says the former president has not been served with any writ in connection with the 33 Ghanaians who died in the Gambia in 2005. Speaking to join News earlier via phone, Frank Ejikum said the office of the former president will respond appropriately when they are served. An international human rights activist, Anthony Rao, on Monday announced he had filed a suit at the International Criminal Court against former president John Ejikum Kufo, MPP flag bearer, in the just-ended elections, Nana Adudankwe Kufuado and the Gambian president, Yaya Jame. He says the two did not do much to uncover the truth behind the murder of the Ghanaians in the Gambia. The Gambia in 2010, after a protracted dispute, paid $500,000 to be given as compensation to families of those who were killed. It followed the findings and recommendations of a joint United Nations Economic Community of West African States report. The report, however, did not find the Gambia complicit in the killings. Though the original number was reported to be 44, investigations revealed six people rather lost their lives, while others were unaccounted for. The remains of the six, together with two additional bodies, were exhumed and returned to Ghana, where they were buried in December 2010. We'll take a break now. There'll be more news following after that. Stay tuned. 
The news, the Coalition of Domestic Election Observers, Kodeo, is observing the ongoing by-election in the Akashi South constituency of the Volta region. In a statement issued in Accra and signed by its national coordinator, John Lavi, Kodeo said it has 15 observers undertaking random roaming observation of polling stations in the constituency. Preliminary observation reports from Kodeo observers indicate that generally voting is taking place smoothly. No incident of violence, harassment or intimidation has been reported by the observers so far. Similarly, no major incident, including failure or breakdown of verification devices, has been reported by the observers. Kodeo observers report of the presence of agents of the various parties' candidates taking part in the elections. Those from the National Democratic Congress, the NDC, the Progressive People's Party, PPP, the New Vision Party, and the Independent Candidate. Kodeo observers report, also report turnout at many polling stations visitors at midday has been low as voters have not turned up to cast their vote. At 1.30 p.m., for instance, only about 300 voters out of a total of 885 registered voters at the ARS Church Shell Block polling station had cast their ballots. Kodil has, however, observed an instance where voters were being persuaded to vote for a particular candidate. At the Tova community, the Kodil observer noted that a gong gong beater was going around urging people to go out and vote for one of the contesting candidates. Kodil says it will issue another statement of the voting, counting, and declaration of results. But right now, we go over to the constituency where we have Ivy Setoji. She's standing by to give us the very latest on the uh, outcome of the polling there. Good evening to you, Ivy. Are you able to tell us uh, if vote, uh, counting is over and uh, if, if we have a winner? Uh, well, right now, um, they are still collecting at the collection center at Akachiko, and the counting is still underway because um, many of the uh, officials couldn't get their ballot board to the collection center early enough, so they are still counting. And what I have seen so far, and what I've heard so far, it seems the NDC is now leading. That is how it seems now. So, apart from that, everything is calm. The police are also here. Keeping, uh, making sure that everything is going on well. Now, Ivy, can you run us through the candidates who are contesting the election, this by-election again? Um, we have the NDC, uh, that's uh, Bernard Ahiaf for uh, the independence for uh, Evans, Gadetto, Jikunu, and then the PPP is Anthony Chikata, and the New Vision Party is Wisdom at Bovi. Right, thank you. So, when are you expecting? When can we get to know, uh, the, get the confirmation that uh, who has won the election? Um, as of now, I can't tell for sure. But we are hoping maybe by 10 p.m. something might come up that they, they, they might declare the winner by 10 p.m. or 11. Right, thank you very much. That was Ivy Setoji reporting from the Akashi South constituency where there's a by-election taking place. And as you just heard, there are no surprises. It turns out the NDC candidate is clearly in the lead and is likely to win the seat. In other news, power outages or blackouts are notorious for the inconvenience they cause, especially at night. For motorists, however, apart from the inconvenience, which is not limited to the night, there is also the chaos, gridlocks, and sometimes accidents that come with traffic lights malfunctioning when an outage occurs. Is there anything that can be done about it? Yes, there is, even though it may not happen as quickly as you may want it. Adelaide Arthur has this report. This is a typical situation motorists find themselves whenever traffic lights are unable to function because of an outage. Almost all the motorists insist on having their right of way, with some resorting to unorthodox means to get around the chaos. Others simply refuse to acknowledge the challenge in such situations and speak at unreasonable levels, causing crashes in some instances. Power rationing in recent times means each day, traffic lights somewhere in the capital or elsewhere in the country will go off. Our roads, on the other hand, 
Do not take the day off simply because the lights have ceased functioning and so chaos ensues. The authorities say efforts are being made to resolve these crises with ongoing rehabilitation of the traffic light system. Metro Roads engineer of the Department of Urban Roads, Abbas Awulu, explains some have been fitted with battery backups which should keep them functioning for up to 48 hours. According to him, resolving this issue in the short term is to provide battery power backups to those that do not have them in order to prevent traffic jam during power outages. What we intend to do is to put in some power backups at least about the 48 hour power backups there as a temporary means of or the short term means of trying to help resolve the problem. We're also talking to a lot of companies within that corridor. Uh, one is to have an alternative power source. And the traffic lights don't take, they don't even consume up to a refrigerator or something. It's quite small. We want to appeal to the commercial interest within that corridor. Once you have generators that you can easily help us with, as part of your social, their social responsibilities, we'll be too happy to get an alternative power source. Others, such as the traffic lights at the Kaukudi, Afrikiku and Nationalism Park intersection, are now solar powered with another yet to be installed at the intersection at the American House once the road is completed. Abbas Awulu says the intention is to power traffic lights in all 145 intersections in the capital using solar energy. New traffic lights to be mounted in over 60 identified junctions will also use solar. We are generating enough um, power from the solar that uh, even at the Nationalism Park, the one in front of Accra Sports Stadium, we intend to connect that also to the uh, Osu uh, Cemetery traffic light because we're getting so much energy from this that we can also uh, power the nearby uh, intersections with that. Once this has been worked out, we can start gradually moving on to solar uh, control intersections or solar being used as the main power source for the intersections. We expect that by the end of the year or midpoint next year, our 207 of our traffic lights shall all be solar. He says the Accra Intelligent Traffic Management System, expected to start in March this year, will offer a complete traffic revolution with a central control room to remotely manage traffic. Through a, a central control point, one can see what is happening at every traffic intersection within the city. Once those traffic lights are in, they'll be synchronized. They'll be able to talk to each other so that if you are driving at a particular speed, you can go through the traffic lights without necessarily stopping. So if you're driving at 30 kilometers per hour, you should be able to arrive at the next traffic light. Well, once, probably you are doing 30, by the time you get there, it will be green for you. The next traffic light will also be green for you. And it's, we're using that method to help reduce congestion. The 97 million US dollars project funded with a loan from the China Development Bank, when completed, will improve safety and also detect red light violation. It will also control speed, determine traffic volume at any given time, as well as provide vehicle messaging to feed motorists with information on traffic situation so they can change their route when necessary. So it all sounds very high tech and probably the solution to the chaos that often comes with more functioning traffic lights except these projects do take time. So until then, drive safely. Now workers at the Bui Hydroelectric Dam sites have staged a demonstration to demand an increase in their wages and better conditions of service. The mainly Ghanaian workforce is peeved their Chinese counterparts are treated a lot better, accusing the authority of giving them a raw deal. Nestor, Nestor Kafui Ajuma was at the Bui camp and came through with this report. When our crew got to the project site, the DCE for Banda, Alex Bonsu, and some top security officers in the Brongahafo region were in a meeting with the irate workers. They are unhappy with a recent 50 peswa increase in their wages to 7 cities 50 peswas. One of their leaders, Charles Okra, told Joy News they were also not comfortable with the redundancy or exit allowance of 500 Ghana cities, a 40 peswa a day risk allowance, and a denial of canteen allowance. He says management keeps telling them the TUC is responsible for bargaining on their behalf and that they will continue that demonstration until something is done about their situation. The district chief executive has meanwhile assured he's working closely 
with the Bui Power Authority and the aggrieved workers to solve the problem as soon as possible and get the project completed on time. I do apologize for the loss in sound there. Uh, the, meanwhile, the Bui, the authorities supervising the construction of the Bui Dam, have begun negotiations with agitating workers over their severance package. In an earlier interview with joining us, Assistant External Relations Officer of the BPA, Maoli Fui Kwajuvia, said authorities of BPA are hopeful that by tomorrow the issue would be resolved with the workers. Sections of the Konfanochi Teaching Hospital are to be temporarily closed down if congestion at those units persists. Authorities have named the emergency unit as one of those facing closure to the high number of patients on admission. They say the congestion is hampering smooth operations. Mohamed Nuruddin has the rest of the story. In spite of the hospital's 12 patients per section limit, there is double of the number at the facility currently. A situation, they say, is affecting smooth administration of the hospital and quality health care delivery. For instance, the orange section at the hospital has over 24 patients compelling authorities to create an extension. The hospital has a certain capacity and that when the capacity is exceeded to a certain limit, then the possibility that um, we have to take certain drastic measures arises. This is a 1,100 hospital, but there are several occasions that you come here and you will not be able to find a space for a fresh patient. Presently, authorities are compelled to manage with the condition, but will be required to temporarily close down some of the section and turn away patients if situation persists. All our clinics are congested. It is because this is the only facility of its kind in this region. And one of these measures is to temporarily um, close certain sessions down for a period of time until we've been able to uh, discharge some of the patients and create fresh spaces to allow for fresh admissions. The hospital requires expansion to enable it to admit many patients at a time. It's about time that efforts are made to expand some of the peripheral facilities to a level where they can take some of the pressure that's on this hospital in order to uh, improve healthcare services in this region. Public relations officer Kwame Frimpong appeals to other facilities to help absorb other patients to reduce pressure on the Konfanochi Teaching Hospital. He suggested establishment of a regional hospital and expansion of other facilities to curb the situation completely. Mohamed Nuruddin's report for Joy News, Kumasi. Just watching the Joy News on the, the primetime news on the Joy News channel still to come in the bulletin and it's in business. Traders at Accra Centre complain about a slump in the value of their products due to an influx of fake, fake artifacts. We have a uh, uh, better particulars coming up. Traders at the Arts and Crafts Centre in Accra complaining of a slum in the value of their wares in recent times. They blame this on foreigners they say are flooding the market with imitated copies which sell for much less. The dealers are concerned, apart from being thrown out of business, that local artifacts may lose their authenticity. Matilda Nyakwa Dennis has more. It has been the point of call for authentic Ghanaian artifacts ranging from clothing, sandals, drums and accessories, a reason why it is a must-visit site for all tourists, especially foreigners. There is, however, no guarantee now that the items you buy here are authentic and the copies are that good. You could easily fall for it. Take these beads, for instance. Of course, there is also the traditional Bonire Kente that is fast being ditched for the printed version, a situation Kente weavers have had to complain about in recent times. 
Interestingly, the foreigners are said to be good in identifying and rejecting the imitated ones with local shoppers rather opting for them, perhaps because of the price. Do we have these Chinese people who have been bringing inferior goods to this system and it's also affecting our local uh, um, manufacturing, that's the kinti. You understand? They have brought this um, machine, printed kinti, which is competing with our handmade ones. And they also have some necklaces and other things which they, they import from China, which is also affecting us very well. Kwesin Tiamwa says the problem is worsened by hawkers from other West African countries who lurk around the gates to sell. They just come here, you see that they are just an entry, they are just entrance here and here. So they just come inside, you understand? And when, when they, when they like, um, a bus come here, they just rush to the entrance of the bus and trying to... And at the time they do scare the foreigners away, you understand? Yeah, they, they, I remember once, one time a bus came here and uh, the people were complaining that we have not enough security here, so they just drove off and then went, went away. Nanabe Kai Menta has been selling here for more than 15 years. He says the errands traders are giving them a bad name. If the government can even help, you know, because here is the National Cultural Center. Sometimes they take our name to some places, let's see the foreigners. Sometimes when they come here, when they come here, they can buy something. When they go, they do to say, I went to the art center to buy this, and the thing is not good. But I, to me, I don't think they bought it from the shop. You can ask the person, where did you get it from? He said, I get it from the boys in the outside. So that's the thing that can affect the, um, I think, the shop and then, then Ghana. According to this trader, customers should endeavor to enter the stalls to see what is available so they can at least decide whether they still want the fake ones. The errant traders were nowhere to be found at the time the news team visited and we were told they come at strategic times. Uh, meanwhile, in another development, the Ghana Union of Traders Association has indicated plans of impending unannounced suits to flash out foreign traders from retail market reserved for Ghanaians. This, according to Guta, is the new strategy it has devised to deal with the influx of the foreign traders in these markets. The soups will be carried out by the Interagency Trade Task Force set up last year to deal with the issue. Guta President George Ofori tells judges that the new decision was arrived at a meeting with the task force. In other business news, the local currency, the Ghana CD, seems to have started the year on a very good note after experiencing a terrible 2012. According to a report by the research wing of the Ecobank Group, the currency emerged the third strongest in Africa against the dollar as at the end of January. The report tracks the weekly and year-to-date performance of the currencies of 22 top African countries against the dollar. The local currency came third in the rankings after the Liberian dollar and the Cameroonian CFA franc. This is the first time the city has made such strong showing in Africa after performing poorly from the middle of last year when it became one of the worst performing on the continent. Head of Economic Research at the Ecobank Group, Agus Downey, attributes the city's performance to recent interest in government securities by foreign investors following from the peaceful elections and the continuity in government policies. Mr. Downey adds that the outlook for the city is quite favorable. Next up, we'll bring you some smart investment tips.
And on one other local business story, the 2013 Ghana Economic Forum has been launched in Accra. It brings together industry players, leaders, and civil society to discuss and debate on key issues affecting the economy and also find solutions to help overcome the challenges. Stakeholders present at the launch advise leaders in various sectors to focus on achieving set goals and be courageous in decision-making so as to lay a solid foundation for future generations. Up next, we bring you international news.